Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thank you so much, Peter. Happy to be here. All right. Great to have you. So let's kick it off by uh, giving the listeners uh, a little bit of background about yourself. I know you had a, a decent stint at JP Morgan Chase, it seems like, but um, tell us some of the highlights of your career to date before Stratify. Wonderful. So yes, I started my career at JP Morgan Chase. I spent over a decade there in both lending and risk roles in, in the institution, which is when I I uncovered many of the problems or saw firsthand many of the problems that we address here at Stratify. Prior to that, uh, I am an engineering undergrad, studied machine learning in my undergrad degree before it was called that. Uh, it was just called advanced statistics back then. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when I was transitioning out of uh, JP Morgan, when I decided to leave, I very much had the hopes and dreams of starting a company. Uh, you know, my parents are entrepreneurs. They started a business around the time I was born and then built and grew it into, um, you know, a, a, a multinational business that they eventually sold to a strategic. So those were my true, I guess, first jobs, starting from, you know, answering the phones when I was in, in high school, all the way up to network editing when I was in college. So, wow. um, you know, I always had that entrepreneurial, if you will, spirit within me, went the completely other direction as many I would say third children often do um, out of undergrad, but then uh, very much knew I wanted to return to that that home and and be a founder. Okay, so let's talk about the the founding story then. Stratify yeah. what what specifically did you see, and what was what what we, what are you trying to solve? Absolutely. So interestingly, after leaving uh, J.P. Morgan, I I had an experience, a personal experience where a credit card product um, was heavily marketed to me actually by Chase uh, of, of all people. Um, <laughs> and it had a great points plan and I'm a, a sucker for a good points plan. And I uh, signed up for the credit card and I was rejected. And that then led me to you know, call the number on the back of my rejection notice, talk to someone that, that I provided some additional information to. And then literally you can almost hear the boo, 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 boo in the background. And I was actually approved over the phone. Uh, and that experience for me really opened my eyes uh, uh, to the way in which credit decisions are made by so many institutions and the large groups of people that are left out from those decisions. You know, I was in a fortunate place. I didn't need that credit card. You know, it was not something that was going to materially change my life. Um, but for many other folks, uh, these types of credit products are are you know, help them buy their first home, help them, you know, fund inventory for their, for their small business, uh, you know, and have really meaningful impact. And, and that, that was something I really wanted to address. Um, I was fortunate around the same time to meet my co-founder, uh, Dimitri Lesnick, and he had been spending the prior decade before us meeting, uh, developing a, a family of algorithms that's still at the core of the technology and services uh, um, we provide at Stratify. And what's really nice about that family of algorithms is it enables you to learn from data automatically, scalably, but in a way that is highly, highly transparent to the user. Um, so I saw the application within credit um, and within other highly regulated use cases where you know I, in my previous life at JP Morgan, had even struggled to get the right technology to, to fit the problems that we were trying to solve. Okay, so then what how, like fast forward to today um yeah. i know you've been you, you founded it a few was it 2017 20 yeah, 20, mm -hmm. yeah. so mm -hmm. as you know over six years ago now um how tell us a little bit of how the company's evolved and how you how you describe the company today yeah so when describing the company i, I start with our mission which is has been our mission since since the get-go which is to enable greater financial inclusion for people while also helping uh, financial institutions better manage and mitigate risks. We see it as two sides to the same coin. We can't do the first without doing the second, um, or we can't do the first scalably without also doing the second. Um, so when we, when we started the company, we were very focused on credit risk scoring um, and credit risk decisioning. So helping lenders understand the true risk of borrowers, primarily consumer and small business borrowers, um, helping them understand that true risk and make more informed decisions based on, on those uh, uh, enhanced risk predictions that yes, leveraged insights from data in an automatic way, but did so in a way that still allowed a non-data science user to understand what the heck was going on, which we see continue to see is really important. 
Um, fast forward to today, um, you know, there has been a ton of focus in the industry, um, not just on AI and machine learning over the last in particular year or so, um, but a tremendous focus on the industry about how uh, technology can be leveraged, but in a safe and sound and fair way. Um, and, and, and we are perfectly positioned for that. Um, I would argue that maybe when we started the company, we were still a little bit early for the market. Um, but the growth trajectory that we've seen, particularly over the last 18 months, has really been unbelievable um, and also allowed us to expand into other use cases. Um, so right now we also have customers in, in fraud detection um, where we're, we're helping them identify fraud, ensuring fairness um, and, and reducing false positives along the way. And then we also pulled out our bias detection and mitigation capabilities into a separate solution that we call Unbiased. Um, that focuses square on squarely on fair lending risk assessment and enables lenders to do that um, more efficiently, more proactively, and and identify risk before they become problems. Right, right. So I, I want to talk about that, but not uh, before yeah. we get to it. Yeah. I want to um, I want to sort of get a sense of who you're working with. What are what are some of the financial institutions? What types of financial institutions do you work with right now? Yeah. Uh, so we started off working primarily with fintechs. Um, so those were our early adopters, our initial customers, and enabled us to get some some uh, really unbelievable product feedback and, and quick iteration cycles on our offerings. Um, now we're working with banks, and we're working with banks actually from a pretty wide spectrum right now. Um, our largest banking customer is a top 10 bank in the U.S., um, and then we're also uh, working with uh, smaller community banks um, and a number of CDFIs, most notably through a recent initiative we launched um, called Underwriting for Racial Justice and the pilot program that we're the technology partner for that we can definitely talk more about. But um, we see a huge opportunity in the CDFI space in particular. We see a huge opportunity in uh, community banks um, for uh, technology like ours. And then we're also seeing quite a demand from uh, the, you know, I would say big community banks transitioning into uh, regional banks as well. Okay. So then you, you're not in this space alone. Um, mm -hmm. There are others that, um, that are also providing uh, services to the, those kinds of financial institutions. What, how are you different from others in the space? Yeah, so where we really differentiate ourselves is in the level of, of transparency that we provide into both models or scoring systems and decisioning uh, systems. So that has become a little bit of an overused buzzword where everybody claims to have transparency. You know, when we say that, we mean that uh, our users have full visibility into the inner workings of, of how a model or a strategy works. Mm -hmm. um, they also have the power to make changes uh, and do so, you know, without writing a single line of code. Um, we find that that ends up being really meaningful, especially for, um, again, this commu the community banks out there um, and, and even many of the regional players that, you know, if they have a data science team, it may be a few people, if that, they're really stretched, overworked. And what we really are focused on doing is how do we bring the tools of data science um, to the subject matter expert, um, to the user that really understands credit and sure is, is very highly competent in data and, and knows data, but is not a data scientist, is not a uh, engineer. How do we give them tools that they can really um, uh, feel comfortable using because of the level of visibility and control that we provide versus others. So no black boxes whatsoever um, with Stratify and all that is enabled by that core technology that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so um, I wanna touch on bias. You, you mentioned yeah. it a couple of times already here. And you know, what, what it sounds like this was a really um, founding principle for you guys. Uh, what is the, um, what is your approach? Maybe you can explain exactly, you know, how your models are able to identify bias better than others. Yeah. So this is some, you're absolutely right. Part of our founding approach, you know, our, our initial solution that we built, um, our, our credit risk assessment and decisioning solution always included bias as a KPI of models. 
Um, so we always thought that that was one of the performance indicators that you should be looking at when evaluating different strategies, different options, different models. Um, and, you know, one, what we do is we are not in the business of saying or determining what is fair or what is not fair. What we are in the business of doing is offering a number of different tests metrics, all of which can be easily leveraged within our tools to evaluate the uh, potential bias that could creep into addition. So one thing we do, Peter, is we support a number of different bias metrics and let, and let our user make the decision about what metrics matter most to them, what, what metrics matters, matter most to their regulators, their customers, um, and they can select those. Um, and then the way our unbiased product works is the first step, we, we actually break it into three steps, uncover, understand, undo. So the first step on Cover is all about running those tests, running them in a, in a very uh, robust yet automated fashion um, such that a lender can run those tests more frequently and more proactively. If a risk emerges, according to one of those indicators, we move to step two or allow the user to move to step two within our products, which is understand. There we decompose that risk. So what are the primary drivers? What are causing that bias risk to emerge? Um, and then after illuminating that, we are giving um, you know, our customer the information they need to determine if they need to take action. And if they decide they wanna take action, we, we also with the undo component can help them figure out the way to remediate, uh, make changes to their models um, and, and, and correct for or compensate for the bias that has emerged. because. Nobody sets out to build <laughs> a bias model or a right. bias decisioning strategy, right? There's not a lender out there that says, hey, you know, um, either my humans making decisions nor my automated system or some combination of both as is the case at many lenders, right? Um, nobody intends to have that bias. Um, but we find that a lot of the robust checking that happens, happens kind of on launch before a new strategy is launched. And then yes, there are periodic check-ins as well. Um, but oftentimes things can kind of get off the rails faster um, than the next uh, periodic check that comes in place. So, you know, our goal with this product offering, what we've been able to deliver as to customers is, you know, better visibility into an ongoing monitoring of those risks such that you can address an issue before it becomes a big problem. So you might see like someone's running your models and you know, it's going through, it's been safe several weeks go by mm -hmm. and they can start to see, hmm, there's a, there seems to be like, whether it's, you know, women, whether it's racial, uh, yeah. whatever that you can, you can say, right. It seems to me that you're, you're declining more of these, you know, the, these um, types of people than you should be. And so mm -hmm. is that, and, and then they can, sounds like, you know, is this something that you're, is it like a, I mean, people obviously are making loans every day and rejecting yeah. loans every day. I mean, is this something that just, is there a trigger point or does the customer set the trigger point? Customer gets to determine the the frequency with which they want to run the evaluation. You know, we, we can do it, you know, uh, daily or, you know, even multiple times a day should a customer want. Though we find that in most cases, we're looking at monthly or quarterly that folks want to do these checks. It's very hard to measure um, if, if you don't have a sample set that is a big enough size, um, you can run into situations where you may flag something that is not statistically significant. Um, so we're really focused on, you know, not just the, the, the measurement, but ensuring that that measurement is statistically significant so that we can feel comfortable quantifying something as a risk and we're not, you know, throwing up a bunch of, of flags where they, where they don't need to be. Right. I imagine that could be a challenge for some of the smaller community banks, right? That don't have, uh, exactly. don't have that volume. Exactly. Don't have the volume to, you know, run with any more frequency, you know, than monthly, if that, and often for the smaller banks, they want to run that on a quarterly basis. Um, but, you know, the techno our technology enables them to run with whatever frequency they want, but we find the market wants monthly or quarterly. So are you, did, you, did your system also kind of help with the adverse action letters or the, you know, what someone like you, the, the, someone's been declined and obviously yeah. we need to, you know, you, like, like people need to know why is that part of what, what's your, what's your offering there? 
Absolutely. And it's also something I, I see as a differentiator of ours, again, pointing back to the level of transparency of our underlying approach. Um, a lot of folks that use other machine learning approaches and then provide adverse action notices off the back are using things like Shap Shapley values to provide those adverse action notices or those, those reason, the reason codes. Um, you know, regulators have come out and, and, and I would say raised flags about those types of postdoc explainers. Now they haven't said they're not explainable enough. I think the exact language that was the postdoc explainers may not be transparent enough for the use uh, for this type of use. Um, but that's still, a, I would say, hotly debated item in the industry, and, and many folks are, are, are leveraging those methods um, if they're using more black box machine learning solutions. We, we don't have that problem um, because the underlying nature of, of our models is they're, they're interpretable, meaning they're visible or transparent you know, from the building blocks up as opposed to layering a model on top of a model to understand how the model's working. Right, right. And then you've got, you know, like you've got the CFPB who've made it pretty clear that they want to, they, they, they don't want to see any uh, bias in, uh, in lending models. So, yep. I mean, uh, most, I, mean, I imagine all, or most, if not all lenders would be pretty um, aware of this today. And is this, so is the, is the bias piece something that, um, is like you is top of mind for lenders today or how do you when you're having conversation is this sort of the the feature that they're most interested in or what, what what's it like um it's an interesting market environment i would say top of mind for most banks is grow deposits and then grow deposits and then grow deposits mm -hmm. <laughs> um but uh, uh a bit of a joke but um uh it it is that being said it is a huge focus um, banks right now, given the environment we're in, are slashing headcount costs, et cetera, and looking for ways to automate processes, looking for scalability, looking for efficiencies via technology. Uh, AI and the subfield of machine learning has a ton of value to offer to drive those kinds of um, scalability and efficiency gains. Uh, but we find that many in the market are still fairly timid on using machine learning for these types of high value, high risk, highly scrutinized scru uh, high <laughs> decisions with high levels of scrutiny. I'll go that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's where we're really able to differentiate ourselves. That's why we've seen the growth that we've, we've seen um, is, is because we can offer them the benefits of that technology without some of the drawbacks, you know, without making them feel like they have to sit and blindly trust a score or a model they don't understand, you know, they, they can very easily, uh, you know, customize everything to those, their particular risk tolerance, their particular customer base. They see, again, see exactly what was learned from data, can change it, can override, can, you know, uh, put additional information into the system that is outside the data to compensate for things like bias, to compensate for the things, you know, things like the data is always backward looking. So that I think has, has, has really helped us in what is ultimately a tough environment. Right, right. So, so let's talk about the, the data itself, because I'm curious, um, you know, I presume you're just using, you know, standard credit data. There's nothing um, that you're bringing in necessarily that, uh, uh, you know, maybe you can tell me tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. but I, I I would love to kind of get a sense of the kind of data that is really becoming um, critical, you know, critical to um, to some of the, um, the things we've talked about here to identifying some of this bias, um, and maybe yeah. data that's uh, that, that's less important. Yeah. So a, f a few things on the data side. Um, often we meet the customer where they are. And we have data partnerships, but Stratify itself is not a data provider. Right. So, you know, we are not saying, hey, add this data element to your model and you're going to, you know, achieve uh, analytics bliss. Um, we are working with the, the data assets that they have or data assets they acquire through one of our data partnerships um, and, and making the best use of, of that, extracting maximum value from that. Um, we still find 
that the majority of lenders, especially as you you know move into the community community bank space, um, are still using traditional credit data. Um, what they're looking for is a better way to extract value out of that that data um, to achieve greater performance, greater accuracy, um, uh, but you know without sacrificing visibility, transparency, control. Um, there's a lot of talk about additional data elements and many lenders, either FinTech or larger lenders are using other data elements to help um, especially compensate for um, thin or no file applicants. You know, from our work, it shows tr you know, tremendous pro promise in these areas. You know, I'm a, a big believer in rental payment data, for example, mm -hmm. and, and in particular, the ability for that data um, to really help um, help on the, on the fairness side, drive down bias and, and help, uh, boost up some of those, those uh, thinner file applicants. Um, we've all seen, and I'm, you, I know you've read the studies, you know, from, from, uh, FinReg Lab and others who we also partnered with FinReg Lab on a, on a very interesting study on machine learning and underwriting, but, you know, cash flow, uh, cash flow based underwriting also extraordinarily promising. Um, and again, we see different lenders at different points in their adoption curve on those alternative data. Um, it's always interesting to me though, because many lenders still, when you talk about alternative data or data outside of a credit report, think that you're talking about scraping someone's social media profile. Right, right. <laughs> right, and I often joke like, you know, in our space, alternative data is not that alterna, right? Right. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes you have to kind of talk people down as you're starting to broach that conversation. Um, but in, in every one of those discussions, as I'm sure you can imagine, especially in the market environment, key question for that lender to answer is what is the additional uplift that, that that data element gives? Does it justify the cost I have to, or the friction I have to introduce to, to, um, to get it? Um, and, and we often see folks using our products to help do that test, if you will, as well, um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to explore the value of that additional data element. Um, the other thing I'll mention here, Peter, is that we have seen that um, you don't need thousands of attributes to make good decisions in, in credit. Um, and that oftentimes there is almost like a point of saturation, um, where yes, perhaps you're adding, adding marginal incremental value, but it doesn't necessarily, necessarily ju justify the increased model complexity, um, or the cost of, of that data, um, so, so we are not in the, like some of the others in our space of the, we look at thousands of attributes to make a decision um, with any of our customers right now, yeah. you know? So then when you're, when you sign up a new customer, a new mm -hmm. lender, what is involved in the process of implementing Stratify? Yeah. What, how long does it take? Take us through a typical journey there. Yeah. Um, so initial engagements typically begin with, with a pilot agreement that runs for between one and three months in that pilot agreement. We exchange data, you know, that is the lender's data that is exchanged with us. It's all anonymized, so they don't have to share any PII with us or anything like that, which is, is quite helpful. Um, and, and then we, we have conversations about if they want to explore other data assets, again, usually in pilot, that's not something that folks are doing. Um, and then uh, we work with them to build an initial set of challenger models and challenge, challenger strategies. Um, you know, so models producing a score, strategy producing a decision, right? Um, work to, with them to, to, to produce a set of challenger, um, challenger models and strategies within our, within our software that they can then evaluate. Um, then for ongoing uh, execution, we're often integrating with an LOS for ongoing execution, just via API, and that's all controlled by our products so that you can easily, um, with the proper controls, promote a new strategy to the one deployed for an API without having to change the integration. And then we see usually lenders will roll that in. So no lender is going to, after a pilot, as we move forward into a long-term engagement, you know, on day one, flip everything over to the new challenger model. So usually that gets rolled in um, over time. 
uh, starting at a certain percentage and then kind of rolling that in. Okay. So then how have your, your models that you've developed, your AI models, how have they improved yeah. over time? Yeah. So great question. Um, and it, it gets me to, to another point of, of, of differentiation. Um, we do not take our customers' data and then create a, you know, shared repository for all of that data that is then leveraged by every other customer. So our customers' data remains their data, um, which we see is really important to them. Um, that said, with the way that our family of algorithms work, um, the you could think of it as features or insights that are being extracted out of the data that is that is ours. Um, and that is then used to enhance or improve, you know, creating, if you will, the network effect for our company of with every new customer we get, it adds value to everybody. Um, so, so that's how we do it. Um, we purposely, though, are not creating that, you know, big data repository that everybody is drawing from. Okay, so um, you know, we're coming up on a, on a year since um, Chat GPT was released, and everyone started talking about AI. I mean, it's just amazing. I, you look through any any newspaper today, and there is AI. There's AI articles yeah. every single day. Yep. Everyone's talking about it. Um, how has that sort of changed? Has, has that changed your approach? Has it made it easier to kind of to or more difficult to kind of explain what you're doing? Um, fantastic question. Uh, the, the answer is it has increased the conversations around the topic and I think created almost two camps within financial services. And you could slightly correlate these camps to the asset sizes of the institutions they work with, but it wouldn't be perfect. And the one camp sees the promise, sees the value, sees the risks, of which there are many, sees the risks as well, but wants to figure out, and in many cases needs to figure out, you know, a number of our institutions that we work with, you know, uh, have a indirect mandate from their board to figure out a way to leverage this technology. So they have a real um, desire to figure out how to make it work for them um, with a healthy, I would say a healthy dose of fear. The other camp, is just been too inundated, you know, sees the word AI and immediately turns off. And, you know, as I've been active on the conference circuit as many others have for the past two months, and it has been very interesting to me to see those, it, it, people are not in between, or I have found very few in between. They fall in one of those two camps. Um, you know, I, I believe very strongly in the power that AI technology, broadly speaking, has to bring um, to the finance industry. Uh, if you if understand that with great power comes great responsibility and, you know, these tools can be used to make things a lot better, especially in the issues of fairness, they could also be used to ingrain bias and scale bias exponentially into decisions going forward. And we're at, I think, an inflection or decision point where, you know, I really hope it goes the former way, but if we don't have the right controls in place, controls that don't stifle in innovation, but controls, you know, we, we, we could have a situation where all of the biases of the past become encoded in the decisions of the future. Right. So I want to switch gears a little bit and yeah. um, talk about your uh, like raising money. Cause when we, we, we last chatted, you had just, I think you just closed your, yeah. your funding round. I don't even know if it was public yet, but you yeah. just closed it and um, congratulations. It's not easy to Thank close you. a funding round in, uh, in 2023. Um, so tell us a little bit about that process, who are your investors and how, and how, it, how that process went. Uh, well, it was a very challenging fundraising environment. There's no question about that. Um, but we are very fortunate to have investors that both 
share our mission and values, um, but also see the tremendous upside for Stratify. Um, and, you know, we benefited strongly from having relationships over the long term, right? We, we have been around for a while and we have been nurturing relationships with investors for a while. And that then meant that when we were going out to fundraise, we were actually as shocking as it seems, given the funding environment, doing it opportunistically. We were raising at that time, not because we were running out of money, but because we had customers that we had either signed or were about to sign. And we needed to make sure that we could scale the team to meet the engagements that we had landed. Um, so also being in that position put us in a greater, of course, position of strength to fundraise. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to do it without those long-term relationships and um, without investors that really care about driving a fairer financial system and believe that Stratify is a key component to making that happen. Okay. So then looking at the at, at your business today, what, what's your biggest challenge to, to try and grow Stratify? Uh, so... One thing that is a challenge right now, and it's always challenging, selling into banks. Not an easy thing to do. Right. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, sales cycles are long. Contracts are lumpy. Uh, we went into this, you know, eyes open. It's not as if this was a surprise to us. We knew that that was a, a, a challenging path that we were, um, we were, we were going down. Um, but that's hard right now. Um, that's that's hard right now in the market environment that we're in right now. And a lot of lenders are um, cutting back on risk, closing down products. Um, and they, in many cases, are doing it with very blunt instruments, um, raising a FICO cutoff, you know, uh, completely closing down a certain offering or completely selling off that offering to the secondary market, right? Um, we see that as an initial reaction that will pass and also create tremendous opportunity, especially for community banks and regional banks that for so long have been squeezed by fintech lenders on one side and large, large banks on the other. So we believe it'll create a really meaningful opportunity. Um, but, but right now that is a challenge. Um, you know, what I am really focused on in addressing that challenge is you know, a classic control the controllables um, we have an unbelievable customer base today, um, continuing to deliver to them, uh, you know, in the highest quality way possible, um, will give us new opportunities to expand with that existing customer base. Um, and then I'm really focused on our team. Um, we have built an absolutely unbelievable team. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that that is, you know, a, a female led team as well, which is a massive, uh, I would say a uh, differentiator, if you will, in the market right. environment that we're in. I'm very proud of that. Um, but you know, uh, I, beyond beyond any one thing that could classify any of our employees, I'm I'm really proud of um, how committed they are to our mission, how passionate they are about the change that we're looking to drive, and how hard they are working to to deliver on that. Um, so you know, I'm really focused on growing that amazing team that we have to continue to meet the new market demand that, that, that we, we will eventually face and, and weathering whatever um, challenges we have on selling into banks in the, in the short term. Okay. So let's end with, with a forward looking question yes. and want to kind of get your sense of where we are today. I mean, AI continues to improve. Um, what, how is this going to develop when it comes to, you know, credit and risk decisions for lenders? What, what's, what, what's this going to look like in five years? time? Yeah. So um, I believe very strongly uh, that we will have a, a lot more automated decision-making in lending. Um, it's not to say that certain decisions won't still require manual review or won't certain still require a second set of eyes, but automated decisioning ne needs to proliferate further than it already has. Um, and, and, and that's going to happen across different product lines. Um, 
But what I think is really important, and this goes to the future of AI and credit and in other places, is that the types of systems that are going to win, that are going to provide the most value to customers, are systems that allow for input from ultimately multiple sources. So that could be data um, as one source, but also humans who uh, machine learning is really good at eating data and finding insight. Humans are really great at applying context to that data information that is outside of the data elements. Um, so I believe the, if you will, the AI of the future, especially for regulated use cases, but I think it for other use cases as well, as the public awareness of AI system grows as we get new regulation likely coming over and, and kind of following a lot of the regulation that we've seen in Europe. And we've already seen the initial stride with that with 1033, you know, there's going to be a real focus on, you know, how do I understand what is happening, not just from data, but also from people combine those two into one automated system and ensure that I can tell the FI or the other type of business can tell their customer on the other side, what the heck happened? How was this decision made? What information was used? You know, um, how can I help you get to a different decision, which I continue to believe is a huge opportunity for a case where you have a negative outcome? How do you build a relationship with that customer to help them get to a positive outcome? You know, it's going to be it's going to be AI systems that can do that that are going to actually deliver on all of the promise and all of the value that we hear about in all of the newspapers. Okay, then we'll have to leave it there, Laura. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, see ya. Bye.